So we have all of these models and all of these tools and tactics. The last eight years has really come down to what is essential? What are the small hinges that open the biggest doors? And where do we need to to think about behavior change as the big driver, which behaviors are the most sticky, sticky place, where are we delivering these health benefits? Is it in the one hour session? Because now Juliet and I have come to believe that this one hour session you go to three times a week is insufficient to meet the demands of you, to teach you and, and meet all your needs around movement and stress and eating. We just can't educate and maximize those, those sessions. It's just too much. So we really start to think differently about the application of the lessons we're learning in high performance so we can transform our households and our and our families and our communities and thinking about where and when sort of those best behaviors have. Hello and welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm Dr. Julie Fouché, family physician and former CrossFit Games athlete. Here, I bring you information and inspiration to help bridge the gap between fitness and medicine and support your journey toward your healthiest self. Thank you so much for joining me. Now let's get started with this week's episode. Welcome to Pursuing Health. I am here with my good friends, Kelly and Juliet Starrett, and we are now about 15 minutes past when we first got together because we've been chatting away and catching up. Um, but you both have been on the podcast before, but it has been almost eight years. Can you believe you how long serious? it's been? You were one of my very first guests. Um, actually, I believe it was episode 17. And so a lot has happened. We were mostly talking about standing desks for kids in that episode. And so a lot has happened since then. So first of all, just welcome back. I'm excited to have you. We're so excited. To I think here. I had hair. That's how Kelly might have had hair at that point. <laughs> Yeah, a lot has changed. But but I thought maybe we would just start there. I mean, 2015 to now, we're in 2023. Obviously, a lot has changed in your lives. You've seen a lot of the fitness and health industry evolve. You've evolved as people, as experts. Um, you, you know, Mobility Wad went to MWAD, went to the Ready State. You've <laughs> moved on from San Francisco CrossFit. You've worked with a lot of other you know, athletes and teams and high performers, you've written books, you've also raised children who are now starting to go off to college. I mean, there's so much that has changed. But, but when you think back over that time frame, like, what are some of the, the ways that you've evolved in your approach or the way that you're, you're thinking about what, what you're doing on a macro scale? Well, yeah, I mean, that's a lot, by the way, that was like an amazing <laughs> summary. And I'm like, well, that there has been, I'm tired. There's, yeah, I was like, I feel tired. That was amazing. You know, I, I think one of the biggest things that probably has changed in us as individuals since that time is in our thinking in particular is I still think in 2015, if you'd ask us, if anyone would have asked us how to exercise and how much to exercise, we probably would have had a much more, I would say, aggro approach to it back then. I think we would have said, you know, you really need to bleed through your eyes and breathe hard. And, you know, if you're not doing pro CrossFit, you're probably not, you know, really even doing anything. And you've right. got to, you know, you've got to lift heavy weights and you've got to do all the Olympic moves and you've got to get your body into every single extreme range of motion. And, uh, you know, I think since then we've really mellowed out when it comes to exercise and really changed our philosophy and, and and part of that is just seeing that, you know, that that strategy doesn't work for people, that so much of an exercise practice has to do with what interests you and what you love. And so we've learned over the years, and I think even more so in recent years that, you know, people will do an exercise program if they're doing something they love. And whether that's CrossFit or Zumba or Peloton, you know, we in the fitness business can all debate until we die about how sophisticated people's exercise programs are and aren't. But in the end, people are only going to do things that they enjoy. And mm -hmm. that's ultimately what matters. And what ultimately matters is that people are moving a lot throughout their day, ideally maybe loading every so often. And, you know, how they do that maybe doesn't matter as much. So I would say that's one evolution we've had in, in that time frame. Ironically, we're talking to 10 years out from when Supple Leopard was published. Wow. Yeah. So May 1st awesome. is May 1st is the 
sort of 10 year anniversary of that book. And I, I think and is it, that why you have the golden supple leopard on your table right now? Oh, and maybe. you're the first person that's even okay, for those who are that. watching yes. the video. I, um, I think, <laughs> We're getting ready for the anniversary. Party. That's right. That's right. Um, you know, in 2015, we're still gathering a ton of data and we're still looking very much at sports and working with CrossFit athletes and the military and government agencies as as data sets of understanding inputs and outputs. And at that point, we really had sort of reached a peak understanding of the richness and sophistication that we have around training. So we have all of these models and all of these tools and tactics. The last eight years has really come down to what is essential? What are the small hinges that open the biggest doors? And where do we need to to think about behavior change as the big driver, which behaviors are the most sticky, sticky place, where are we delivering these health benefits? Is it in the one hour session? Because now Juliet and I have come to believe that this one hour session you go to three times a week is insufficient to meet the demands of you, to teach you and, and meet all your needs around movement and stress and eating. We just can't educate and maximize those, those sessions. It's just too much. So we really start to think differently about the application of the lessons we're learning in high performance so we can transform our households and our and our families and our communities and thinking about where and when sort of those best behaviors have. So what you've seen is also we've turned 50. We turned 50 this year. Oh, happy birthday. And, uh, thank you. And we're just <laughs> playing, we're playing a different game where you know how much I can deadlift is less interesting. My hands are still covered in chalk because I just did hang. <laughs> you know, power cleans from the block, you know, down below right before this. So we're still doing the things we love to do, but how we're thinking about bringing the rest of society along with us has changed. Can I just add one more thing that's been so different in that particular time frame, though, as Kelly was talking, I was reminded that I think in 2015, Kelly was only on Twitter. And it wasn't until 2015 that I was like, Hey, I think maybe you should be on Instagram. Like we should probably be on Instagram. It seems like it's kind of a thing. And and so I do think that's been another change. I mean, obviously there was social media, you know, leading up to that 2013, 2015 timeframe, but I also think it has exploded since mm -hmm. then. And, you know, one of the problems with that, especially when it's, when we are talking about the health and fitness business writ large is that people in our community, I think felt, or we think felt fire hosed with information and really were confused. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what was essential, what to prioritize, what to throw out in the trash. And you can see that in any of the objective measures yeah. around health in our society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it was, you know, just, you know, that that massive proliferation of social media and information. I think it did wonders in terms of making those of us who are in the space better. You know, those of us who are like nerds and want to talk about these topics at the dinner table, like I think we have made ourselves better, but we haven't done a service to the broader population. We haven't cast a wide enough net. We haven't made it accessible and relatable. We haven't talked enough about how people can fit these things into their lives yeah. reasonably, you know, in a time crunch life. And so I, I think, you know, all those things coming together has led us to this moment. Yes. And here we are. And I love that you have taken that. It could be so easy to get really caught up and stay in that world of the high performers, right? The like 1% of 1%, which you've spent a lot of time with, but that you really want to take everything you've learned there and distill it down and use it to help the masses, to help improve the overall health of the average everyday person. And so I think that's where your book comes in, which we have built to move, which is now, can we call it a bestseller? What are we the can. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, we just found one out. One hour ago. One hour one ago. Hour we just ago. found out we're on the New York Times bestseller list. So it's, <laughs> so it's on. Breaking news. Um, even <laughs> though this, I'm sure by the time this episode releases, it'll be like number one on the list, but you're very close. Um, but yeah, tell us. So, so how did the idea for this book come about and what is the purpose of this book? And then we'll dig into some of the, the things that you talk about there. I'll just start with a little history that you of all people can appreciate. As you know, we owned a CrossFit gym for 16 years and ended up closing it in the pandemic, which was um, simultaneously very sad and also very freeing in many ways, um, mm -hmm. you know, as coming from two people who had been running two businesses for a really long time. And 
you know, a few years before that, we'd received a call from an agent who wanted to talk to us about publishing another book. And, you know, we just did not have the space. We were running a gym. We were mm -hmm. running our online business, The Ready State, and we just didn't have the mental or emotional space to even consider writing or marketing another book. We just weren't there. But it was really interesting that when we closed the gym, I think maybe a month after we closed the gym, the, the, the guy who's now our agent called us back. And so mm -hmm. it really felt like this moment in time where like one door of our life closed and gave us the space for another door to open. Mm -hmm. And I think also the timing of the book happening and us writing it in the pandemic after we really saw mm -hmm. how hard and ill-prepared people were to manage, how hard it was and how ill-prepared people were to manage their health during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I think it really highlighted for us how important this book is and, you know, just, just the timing of it being so critical, you know, now landing after we're sort of in a post pandemic universe, but we learned so many lessons during the pandemic that we, you know, some of which we applied to this book. And one of the things that we saw was that people became very comfortable with vital signs, you know, that we look, if you're in and around the CrossFit space at all, there's this phrase called observable, measurable, repeatable, mm -hmm. right. Which is sort of important. And that which gets measured gets managed. I mean, choose, test, retest, the whole idea of having some objective measure around mm -hmm. some of the things around your life. And what we saw in the pandemic was that people were looking at respiration rate. They were looking at their temperature. They're looking at SAO2. They're suddenly becoming very sophisticated around their physiology. And Juliet and I have been, a long time ago, we were actually having a conversation with Gray Cook, who is a, a well-known physical therapist and the creator of the FMS. And he was talking about a conversation he had had with Shirley Sarmon, who is a PT master. And he was trying to kind of talk about making the case for seeing a physical therapist, seeing a physical therapist once a year or twice a year for a Just like you would go to the dentist. Like or your dog. Right. Right? You get an right. annual physical. And she was like, you can't make the case yet because you can't actually show that there'd be demonstrable changes in someone's physical health, if they saw a physical therapist, what would you even check? What would you mm -hmm. measure? Right. Mm -hmm. You guys can look at blood. You can look at vital signs. You can look at sort of talk about all these psycho emotional pieces, but what a physical therapist ask. And one of the things that we have started to realize is as people were being inundated with the fire hose of information, simultaneously failing, being failed by the trillion dollar fitness industrial complex mm -hmm. is that they didn't have a good set of physical vital signs. So physical behavioral vital signs. So we've been talking about, we've created in Supple Leopard, you know, range of motion standards predicated on the range of motion you learned as a physician, the, the range of motion that I learned as a, as a, you know, as a physio and ultimately our, those are objective. And then our other objective measure was output. Could you go faster? Could you lift more weights? So when we started to think about how we could quantify and create benchmarks for people around movement behavior and some of these other behaviors where we suddenly had enough research and information to say, hey, you should be able to stand on one leg this long. If you eat 800 grams of fruits and vegetables, here's what starts to happen. We were able to create a set of vital signs for people that began to sort of run the gamut of where should you be? And if you're below that or above that, don't panic. But now we have a reference line and an objection, objective reference line so that now we can create a common language. And some of the vital signs in the book are around behaviors like sleep and walking. And some of the behaviors are around movement and kind of understanding your range of motion, how that affects your ability to move effortlessly. So now we suddenly are like, okay, I think we have a compelling case to show people how these this collection of behaviors re that's done in their home with their family can really set them up for being a durable person, for being a more resilient person in their lives. And I think we really wrote this book, um, you know, coming from the place of being gym owners and watching our coaches work with clients for yeah. an hour a day, very mm -hmm. similar to what you do, right? You have a certain amount of time it's limited with people and you know, your goal is, I know your goal is to coach people into having, you know, a more holistic view of their health. And, and you guys are coaching people on many of the things that, you know, we are recommending in this book, having been a client myself, but, you know, we also saw that coaches were showing up with a plan for their clients at a gym. And, and it turned out the client would show up often, like completely not ready to execute that plan, tired, jet lagged, 
hasn't eaten mm. breakfast, hasn't eaten lunch, had too much caffeine, has, hasn't had a sip of water, right? Didn't sleep. You know, you know this. Well, I'm not in losing weight. Yeah. And, and so <laughs> then you, you come in as a coach with this like, you know, perfect, really well thought out plan for your client. And you have to throw that in the garbage can and sort of take the person that you have in front of you and work with them for an hour and do your level best to, you know, get them stronger and a little bit more fit in that like one hour time you had. But one of the one of our goals with this book is to sort of have this resource for coaches or physicians or, you know, my best friend is an acupuncturist and have a resource for, you know, professionals to say, okay, well, you can do your level best to help these people in that one hour session you have, but what are you going to give them to take home for the other 23 hours of the day where you're not coaching them, they're not at your CrossFit class, mm -hmm. you know, they're not in your office seeing you getting, you know, personalized help, you know, what do we do for the other 23 hours a day and how do we support people? And, and critically, we really think th these are all behaviors, most of which need to be done in the home. And we want to empower people to take care of their own health in their own homes with mm -hmm. their own families. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I love the concept, like you said, this, what, what gets measured gets managed or, or, um, you know, being able to have objective data that you can look at, because that's, you know, that's all about what we do at Wild Health. And I think that's the expression of in CrossFit, our fitness, wellness, sorry, sickness, wellness, fitness continuum is, okay, we want to try to get all of our markers on fit. But now we have so much data, right? We've got wearables, we're looking at sleep data and CGM data and all of our workout data. And, um, you know, but sometimes it could be hard to sort through and figure out, well, what's actually important here? What is, what are the things that, um, you know, really are going to be most important when I'm thinking about my long-term longevity or goals. And so I love that you guys distilled down, you know, some things that are not, they're not fancy, they're not sexy. They're just like simple, but how many of us overlook those things because we get distracted by, you know, the next, you know, fancy wearable or whatever it is. Well, the allegory in CrossFit is that people, you know, switch programs. No, I'm doing this elite program now put forward by this CrossFit Games athlete. Really, you know, it is okay to be excited and to bounce around and to be curious and to find it. But the basics are the basics. The basics and are the basics. your, yes, you and I might do slightly different on slightly different diets. That's true. Mm -hmm. but what's not unusual is that you and I need roughly the same amounts of protein per, per, per mm -hmm. hour sort of body weights. And universally, I'm pretty sure we all need fiber and micronutrients. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly we can start to say, well, hey, we can turn up and turn down how much fat is in your diet because I don't use fat very well or how many carbohydrates you need to feel what you're doing. But you're not even getting enough protein or any micronutrients. You're drinking a coffee full of 700 calories of fat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, what are we even talking about? You know, we right. started we started becoming interested in some of these things. You know, look... I, Full disclosure, I remember my original CrossFit, like level one back in, you know, 2004. And I was like, oh, conversation on nutrition and it's the zone. Fortunately, I knew the zone. I spoke the zone. I was like, okay, it's, it's familiar. But I haven't wanted to touch nutrition with the 10-foot pole. I had Rob Wolf. I had my friends. I had Matt Lalonde. I had these superstars coming in and helping me understand some of the basics of, of how to eat and fuel. But we had to become interested in nutrition because we were interested in tissue health. You know, that if I was going to talk about your tendinopathy in your shoulder, mm -hmm. I had to talk about the fact that you don't have all the building blocks on board for your body to repair as effectively as it could. And by the way, you haven't slept in a year. Right. Right? Yeah. You're, you're yeah. Netflixing. Again, what are we even talking about? We There was I a really high level pain. CrossFit athlete who came to us during a camp and she was about to compete in this gigantic uh, CrossFit open announcement. Mm -hmm. It was the thrusters burpees forever one. And um, she was having this knee pain that was going on and on and on. And her coach and I, we, like, we scratched our heads and we're like, this doesn't fit. And we couldn't come up with a model to explain this knee pain until we said, can you tell me about your sleep? And they described sleeping with the television on as a self-soothing strategy because they didn't like to travel. They didn't like to be alone. They were alone with their, away from their family. Mm -hmm. And this person was sleeping with a TV on all night long, like blasting them. And lo and behold, all of their recovery scores were wretched. We were using early Omega wave. We were looking at resting heart rate. And all we did was turn the TV off at night and their knee got better. You wow, know? And so we right? started, we're like, hey, there's something to this sleep thing <laughs> that we're going to have to really kind of bear down on a little bit more.
I think you touched on something earlier that I wanted to um, speak to a little bit too, which is, you know, I think you probably are in the same boat as us. We have had access to literally every bell and whistle in the health and fitness business. Like we've, you know, people send us things and, you know, and we just have access to everything. And there are certainly a few things in that, that I would put in that category that have actually changed our lives. Like Kelly sleeps on a chili pad. He was, he, you know, sweated out his entire life until he, you know, started sleeping on a chili pad. And that really, you know, that was a piece of technology that really positively changed Kelly's life and helped him sleep better, which we're obsessed with. But, you know, by and large, most of the, you know, sort of fancy gadgets and gizmos that we've been sent, we, they end up like in the corner of our garage or in the trash can. And we've really realized that again, like what really has pulled the lever for us and what we do consistently are these really basic habits. And we do them over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're not sexy on Instagram. And, you know, they're hard to promote because, you know, they're, they're not exciting to talk about like walking right. is, it's really hard to make. I'm trying to make walking sexy on Instagram. It's really hard. If I can make stretching sexy, you can make yeah, yeah. sexy. You got <laughs> That's true. <I> know. <laughs> I'm like walking and stretching, the two most Killing sexy it. things on Instagram. <laughs> but, you know, I, I so it's so important. You know, we talk to a lot of athletes who think they're killing it because they, you know, they have the right tracker and they're, you know, they've got all the technology connected to their bodies at all times and they can track all their data, but it turns out Often, you know, a lot of the athletes we work with actually have a lot of blind spots when it comes to these basics, because mm -hmm. it's, it's much more fun to sort of ignore some of the basics and, and look at this fancy stuff. And our view is like, yes, all of these tools can be amazing and really optimized, but like you almost need to earn the, you almost need to earn yeah. getting to use those tools. Like, can you get a 10, like we're calling it the 10 out of 10 club with our 10, 10 basic habits in here. If you were in the 10 out of 10 club, man, then like go explore, optimize, use technology like, you know, you get a free pass to do all those things, but you'd be surprised how many like serious athletes we talk to who are like, Oh my God, big blind spots. I only got six out of 10. Like I'm a world totally. champion and I only got six out of 10. Right. And so I think, I think a lot of athletes have sort of left behind the basics in favor of all this fancy mm -hmm. stuff that looks fun on Instagram. And we, we really want everyone to understand that this book is the basis when we're asked to come in and untangle complex musculoskeletal health with organizations like the Marines or the 49ers. This is where we start. We start with individual athletes, with university teams. We, we, we're like, hey, you, we need to make sure we're talking about this. We're not going to skip over this. I know you want to go to the cool stuff. But this makes the basis for all our high-performance endeavors. And so what we've come to realize and feel like, yes, exercise is crucial. Never do nothing. Got to lift a weight. You should have a kettlebell in your kitchen. Yes, I think we demonstrated that by owning a CrossFit gym for almost a decade and a half. Mm -hmm. So, but we really come to see that exercise is an extracurricular. And do you remember, even in the very first CrossFit lectures I sat in, people would be like, well, I CrossFit, so I must need like 28 blocks, right? And Greg, a long time ago, was like, yeah, I think you really only need an extra 300 calories. You should probably just eat an extra yogurt. That's how <laughs> much extra calories you burned in your CrossFit class. And so, you know what I mean? It was, it was bananas that we thought we needed so many other things. So when we cover these basics, we can then see that if we can layer in exercise because we have time or we, we have space or the, you know, the, the mental capacity to layer it on, we have a really rich physical practice. But on days where we can't get to the gym or train the way we want to, we still have this really rich physical practice. And then what happens then is that we can get rid of sort of shed some of the dead weight of you should be lifting weights and breathing hard and you should be focused on diet culture when we really know that that we have a lot of old people in our lives. We I mean, recently we had four women over 95 in our lives and not a single one of them exercised a day in their lives. So something is, <laughs> we know that there's exercise helps, but there's a whole bunch of things I can do to be active and make sure I'm covering the basis so that when I, I am better able to sort of adapt to that exercise. Well, and just to add mm -hmm. on that, I mean, I think, you know, from the data about how poorly we're doing as a society, like, I think the one message that people have gotten is that they should exercise. And a lot of people actually are doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's actually not moving the needle of health. 
And I think, you know, you, the, the work that you guys are doing at Wild Health and, you know, what we're doing, trying to get people back to basics and just focus on sleep and eating some vegetables and moving around. And having hip extension. Having some hip extension. <laughs> I, I, think, I think, you know, I'm really hopeful that these are the things that are actually going to start to move the needle because, you know, they're relatable and accessible. And I mean, you know about the blue zones. Nobody in the blue zone is like strapping on their tennis shoe and going to their orange theory class. Like that's, you know, th those people are super healthy because movement is part of there. It's built into every aspect. Mm -hmm. of Social their relations day. are part. Sunshine mm -hmm. is part, right? right. Vegetables. Right. So there's just right. these things that, um, you know, again, we cannot emphasize enough. We're fans of exercise. We do it a lot, obviously. Yeah. But when that's a given. But if you're if you're listening to this, you are probably a node in your community. People are asking you for fitness advice. People are your family is asking you for fitness advice because that's you know those are our people. Like we know that you're the the agent of change, and we really. One of the the lenses through which, and Juliet already said this, Rich, we wrote this book was we wanted to create a resource to invite people to the party without scaring them away. Because people, we have a garage gym and our neighbors think we're psychopaths. You know, like Juliet and I did, I had like, I was doing skier yesterday and snots on my face and I, <laughs> I can't talk and I'm cleaning the sandbag. And I watched our neighbors be like, I don't know what's going on in there, but those people aren't right in the head. Yep. And so, you know, everything I say is, you know, basically they're going to be like, you're crazy until we say, hey, start here. So yeah. we, quick side story. We had Jason McCarthy on the podcast of Go Ruck, who you mm -hmm. obviously know. Um, and we saw together at a recent event or, or was it wasn't recent. It was almost a year ago. Yeah, it was. Tell you. But <laughs> um but I, I'd been carrying around a 20 pound go rec pack. But after we had Jason on the podcast, I was like, okay, I need to, I need to up level. I'm switching to the 30 pound go rec. So that means I'm taking Kelly's. And that means that Kelly is now relegated to just carrying this huge ass sandbag on this Ridge. And I mean, that has been like, people definitely are like, okay, you guys are clearly the weirdos of the neighborhood. Like, look at that big dude just up here on this trail, carrying an actual sandbag, you know? So totally. we continue to be the weirdos of our neighborhood. <laughs> we gotta be the weirdos, but we can't be too weird to scare people away from having conversations about exactly. the basics. But I can totally relate to, you know, what you're saying about the basics. I think that so many times people, maybe that's where they start, but then they forget how big of an impact the basics have. So they're like, oh yeah, yeah, like sleep's important, but like this other stuff. But you forget when you start doing those things, even how simple they are, how much that shifts the way that you feel, the way that you perform um, your recovery. And I think too, talking about like the exercise, one thing I've noticed since wearing these wearables now are oh, oftentimes the days where I'm getting the most you know, where I'm not going to do a CrossFit workout are the days that I get the most points on my wearables because I'm moving more, you know, which <laughs> comes as a surprise or playing pickleball. Pickleball is the other one that really, really grabs that's awesome. You get a lot of credit. You get a lot of credit for that. A lot of credit for pickleball. Um, but yeah, but let's start diving into some of these. So you have 10 sort of assessments or practices, focus areas. And like you said, Kelly, they're ranging in a lot of different areas from you know, um, range of motion to movement, to exercise or not exercise, exercise is not in there, nutrition, sleep. Um, so talk us through sort of what some of these basics are. You look, look at the very first one. The, the opening salvo is the sit and rise test, which probably people are, are starting to see on the internet a lot more. Mm -hmm. And in short, you should be able to, it's a mid range assessment test of your hip range of motion a little bit of balance, but it's not that balanced because I see little children do this all the time. And all you have to do is lower yourself to the ground in a cross-legged position and stand back up in a cross-legged position without putting a knee down or a hand down. And it really is, you don't have to have great dorsiflexion because you're on the outside of your feet. You don't have to have full hip flexion. You don't even have to be able to flex your knees all the way. But what we see is it's enough of a catch-all that really predicts early mortality, early morbidity. And mm -hmm. what's nice is that it's really clear for people because they're like... I dance, I shred, I'm good. And then they're like, holy moly, blind spot. And I think that's really one of the things that we have seen working with athletes for so long is that people are like, I am so strong. And I'm like, but you're missing 30% of your hip flexion. You have no rotation in your hip. You play in the NFL. How comes no one's looking at these components to your movement life, the components? And so what we've tried to do is sneak in through some simple self-assessments conversations about, Hey, here's a, here's a way to look at, you know, 
pigeon pose or rotation of your hip. Here is, you know, and so every test ends up being an entree into a conversation around a cluster of behaviors that support that thing. It's not just the test. The test sets us up to have the next conversation. So for example, one of the things that we are huge fans of is this thing called sitting on the ground. Wait for mm, it. Mm -hmm. You know, what we have so seen sexy. is that, <laughs> man, we see a lot of people on the, on the Instagram doing all these fancy floor routines and 90, 90 sitting and, you know, all these things. We're like, why don't you do that in front of your TV? Why don't you use your gym time and keep it sacred as your gym time? But we know you're watching TV. The data supports that. Don't lie. You're binging. And why don't you move off the couch onto the ground? And what you'll see is that in the course of 10 to 20 to 30 minutes of sitting, you can adopt a ton of positions and expose your body to key and fundamental shapes that help restore and keep an eye on what your native ranges are. Wow. And I'll just add to that. I mean, I think one of the reasons we want to open with a sit and rise test is that the way to get better at it is so ultimately accessible. Exposure. It's doing the thing. It's just exposure. It's just practicing getting down on, up and down off the ground, whether mm -hmm. that's on your living room floor or a couple times a day at your office or, you know, wherever you do it, it's just doing the thing. And then, and then the, you know, an, the second way to get better at it is just actually sitting in, in on the floor in front of your TV and just, you know, playing around in different positions. And so, you know, that's something that people can relate to again, you know, for, for the sort of non-exercisers or light exercisers that are listening to this, who are like, okay, well, I'm not going to go do some like one hour mobility class at my gym or, you know, go at eight o'clock at night, but, you know, people do have 10 or 15 minutes at night in front of the TV to just put a little care and feeding into their bodies and so I think that's why we were like really excited to start the book with this chapter, because you get some really simple, really quick information about some basic range of motion and the way to get better at it is also really simple. And remember the number one reason people end up in nursing homes can't get up and down off the ground independently. Right. right? P people like to besmirch the burpee and I'm like, well, it's really just training to get up and down off the ground quickly. Yeah. Right? You have to like save yourself when you fall as, as an older person. But one of the things that we learned working in soft tissue health and musculoskeletal health for so long is that we found that if we could get people committed to just doing 10 minutes of recovery, down regulation, soft tissue mobilization at night with their roller, with their ball as a beginning conversation, get that out of the gym, put it in people's homes, we saw adherence went through the roof. We saw that people did it because it was only 10 minutes and mm -hmm. I'm already in my living room, nothing else is going on. They slept better, they mm -hmm. felt better, and suddenly they were starting to conjoin what they were doing for the day. Hey, I, I went for a run, now my quads are a little sore. And then they were administering to that. So they were having these very tightly coupled experiences. Well, then we also were like, well, hey, if we got people sitting on the ground to work on the range, look, there's the roller. And you might as well. So it, it's sort of another follow-on because what we have seen is that we can no longer rely on motivation. Juliet and I are done with willpower at the end of the day. We have two <laughs> teenage daughters. We run a business. Like Juliet puts up with me all day long. You know, what we can't do is make another decision. But if part of our routine is we flip on the TV because we love watching some TV in the evening sometimes – and we sit on the ground, and then there's the roller. I don't have to make another decision. I didn't have to go anywhere. I didn't go to the stretch lab. I just was like, oh, what hurts? Let me make myself feel better. And I yeah. also think we have been trying to send the message that perfect is is not, you know, perfect is the enemy of good when it comes mm -hmm. to doing some self-care on your body. Mm -hmm. And I do think that, you know, we're hoping to change the way people think about health practices um, because we think what we've really taught people because all fitness classes are one hour long, that like anything you do for health and fitness needs to be one hour long. <laughs> and I, and we're really trying to change people's thinking on that, that these little, you know, we've heard the, the phrase movement snacks, mm -hmm. um, you know, however you want to phrase it, that we've really learned that doing things in five minute, 10 minute increments really can actually sort of, you know, move the needle a lot in terms of how your body feels and how you're able to operate and function in space. I mean, you know, the, the person I think of, as I tell the story is Mark Bell, who I, th I think you're familiar with mm -hmm. was, you know, extremely strong power lifter and decided he wanted to change his body. And he's, you know, the way he started doing that was by taking like three or four, 10 minute walks a day. I mean, that was sort of his entry into, you know, going down the path of, you know, losing almost a hundred pounds and changing his body composition and being able to tie his own shoe. And, you know, we feel the same way about mobility work. I think often people think, oh my God, my entire body hurts. Like, where would I ever even begin? And, you know, 
we really want to emphasize this idea of like compounding interest when it comes to these practices, Mm -hmm. you know, 10 minutes a day. Yeah. You might only be able to spend some time on your T-spine and your neck or rolling out your calves. But if you do 10 minutes a day, seven days a week, you know, that's seven minutes. Yeah. Yeah. It really adds up and really can make a difference. And so, you know, we just suggest to people like start somewhere and, you know, the more that you get, you know, into a practice of taking care of your body a little bit, you'll start to be able to hone in on the areas where you really need work and focus there, but mm-hmm. just start somewhere, you we know, and seen, if that's just sitting on the ground, like that's even a great start. We have seen the messaging. You should not do this because you'll die. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't really work. Doesn't really work. It's hard yeah. for people to change their behaviors. You should do this because it'll keep you from dying. Well, I'm not dead. I'm not going to, I can do whatever. I can eat the pizza. I'll be fine. Right? Like the messaging doesn't really work. What we know is that if we can help people feel better tomorrow, then they'll remember what made them feel better tomorrow. And part of that comes from this idea for us that everyone is working really hard these days. Like there's no secret school program anymore. Everyone is is working as hard as everyone else. Where we really start to see the differentials is maybe you have better coaching. Your programming may be better. Not your effort, but your programming. And maybe your genetics. But really, it's all the other behaviors that allow you to adapt to that stress. So if I put two of the top university teams together, those teams are not working each other. But there is one team that may be out able to out adapt. So we call this session cost. So mm-hmm. I do a training session the next day. I can measure your wattage. I can measure fatigue. I can measure, hey, you're slower. You put out fewer watts. Your poundage is down. That's the cost of the session the day before. Central nervous system, tissue recovery, whatever. When we engage in recovery behaviors, we're always trying to reduce session costs so that we can keep average work outputs higher and that average volume ends up being sort of aggregating into more significant change where over time, those two cohorts, some cohort that adapts better, actually can get better and make kind of bigger gains, even though they're working at the same capacity, right? Both people are working really hard. Mm -hmm. But you can apply that same thinking to your stressful life. So- Ultimately, have a death in the family, go through a breakup, you know, have a baby, do something, get jump on her, get, you know, have a surgery. Yeah. Something is going to happen. And ultimately, you know, go through a work deadline. What we're seeing to people are saying now is, hey, you can actually recover and handle that stress, whether it's artificially induced in the gym or introduced in your life these behaviors aggregate and really make you a more resilient person so that you can handle that stress which means you can work harder and be Mm -hmm. fresher, which means you can feel better in the evenings. You can feel better on the weekends and you have more energy to do what you're doing. You think you're maxed out. Oftentimes we have this conversation with athletes. I'm like, your, your recovery and behaviors just suck. You actually can work harder and be fresher. And they're like, whoa, 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 what was that? I'm like, yeah, you can work harder and be fresher. Right. It's so much, so much of those basics in the, in the recovery. So you have a few others that are in that realm of range of motion and different tests that people can do. And I love how you incorporate it into your daily life at home, like something, get down on the floor, watch TV, do your mobility at night. It's a great way also to um, sort of wind down before bed or prepare yourself for sleep. Um, you, You also have some about just incorporating movement throughout the day. So can you talk about those and then how you, how you both personally incorporate that in your day to day life? Well, back to our earlier conversation about trying to make walking sexy, um, <laughs> you know, that's, that's what we're trying to do. And, you know, I'll, I'll start by saying, I realize there's some debate in the scientific community about whether walking counts as non-exercise activity thermogenesis, otherwise known as NEAT. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but what I'll go, what, what I'll say is that it does. And that we don't live in an environment anymore where we get enough other forms of non-exercise activity because we're not like farming. Most of us are not farming our own food and gardening and doing all the the other things that I think maybe people traditionally did to get non-exercise activity in their life. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we really are fans of it. And it turns out that, you know, the the 10,000 step rule was originally created by a Japanese pedometer manufacturer and 10,000 is an auspicious number in Japanese culture. (laughs) And so it was a marketing scheme, but since that time, and I'm sure you're very familiar with it, there has been a massive amount of research that has come in to sort of back up the idea that we need to be moving more and walking more and that walking more ultimately has massive benefits to our health. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, what we've learned is that, you know, 
especially to the extent people are concerned about, let's say, body composition. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what the sedentary researchers are starting to realize now is that it's the total amount of movement that really creates an environment for like lifelong body, you know, having a lifelong good body composition. And that, that, you know, those who are obese often are not just plain not getting enough total overall movement in their days. And that, that really, that small movement, that walking, fidgeting, standing at work, all those other movements that are outside or independent of exercise are really what make the difference in terms of lifelong weight control. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that alone is significant, but, you know, then on top of that, you know, you get sunlight when you walk, um, to, to, to go back to what we talked about before we started recording. I mean, you know, walking is one of the greatest ways we know to connect with other humans apart from technology, even your neighbors in this world where we're, mm -hmm. you know, even your people, jerk neighbor who doesn't want to share a fence. Yeah. A lot of people are struggling, <laughs> struggling with loneliness and isolation and depression. And, you know, if you actually just get outside and interact with your neighbors and take a walk with your friend and, you know, go interact with your spouse on a walk. Like we just find it to be one of the greatest ways to connect with humans. You burn extra calories. You know, you actually practice hip extension, which is like what Kelly is obsessed with as a human. Kelly star at hip extension. Hashtag knees behind butt guy. You know, you, you get your lymphatic system working. I mean, there's like innumerable reasons why we think people need to incorporate more walking into their lives and we're fans of it. And, and again, you know, mm -hmm. trying to make it sexy on Instagram. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think we do a couple things. I mean, we're fans of like the, the taking a lot of micro walks. One of the things we do often is we have about a 17 minute walk from our house to the end of the corner and back. We've calculated that it's 1,750 steps. We often do it after dinner. It takes a little less than 20 minutes. And, you know, so not only do we sort of add in quite a bit of additional movement into our, our days. And if it's summer, sometimes we try to do it barefoot. But we also, the two of us go together, we don't take our phones and we actually have a chance to sort of connect and talk about our days and, you know, talk about our hopes, dreams, and fears. And so it just adds in like a lovely amount of movement and connection into our lives that is so critical. And then as you know, we're also fans of the standing desk mm -hmm. um, and not because we think sitting is bad or that we think standing is good or that standing is bad, but we find that standing desks are a gateway to more movement throughout our day. And so, you know, just even on this podcast, you know, I have a stool here, but I have probably spent half this podcast standing. Now I happen to be perching, Kelly's perching on a stool, but you know, what you'll see throughout an hour conversation is that we've adopted each of us like 27 different positions, which all are little forms of non-exercise activity. So we're just fans of getting people to move and move more. And we think walking is the best way to do it. And it doesn't, again, need to be done. You don't need to book out a whole other hour to walk. There's so many you're, you're little ways all these science sciencey to flushing yeah. your lymphatic system, sleep yeah. stress, <laughs> or whatever, psycho-emotional relationships. How about this? That if I walk a little bit more, hit these movement goals, I burn an extra like 200 plus thousand calories a year. Mm -hmm. It's an insane number of calories. I don't have to exercise. I don't have to do anything else. Make a pile in your mind of ice cream. That's 200,000 calories of ice cream. <laughs> that's the amount of ice cream I get to eat for free. And so what it means is I have a little bit more to me. It means I, one, fall asleep right away. We usually, we're Aura Ring fans. And I get dinged by aura because my sleep latency is under two minutes. Usually. Yeah. Like I lay down and I'm unconscious and, and the ring is like, you're, you're too sleepy. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is my intention to lay down and black out. So if you, again, what ends up happening here is that we are trying to, and this, this was really this idea of trying to figure out where we're going to fit all this came out of some work we were doing with the Marine Aviation's Weapons Tactical School. And what we saw was that we're very, very stressed people. And they asked me to come in and talk about resilience and these, these, these behaviors. And I was like, all right, who got more than eight hours of sleep last night? And a single hand goes up. I'm like, okay, so if you want to change your body composition, get out of pain, grow a body, get stronger, learn a skill, you should Recover get eight. Surgery. Right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, who got less than seven? Because seven is our cut off for surviving mm -hmm. and not a hand goes up. I'm like, who got six? Not a hand goes up. I'm like, who got five wow. or less hours of sleep? And a hundred percent of the hands went up. So wow. what I said to them was, okay, sleep more. Good talk. And then walked away. Right. <sighs> and they were like, ah, what do we do? So what we started to see then was this, again, this idea of this 24 hour duty cycle where Juliet and I as busy parents, as people who work, 
we realize we have these moments of agency and shifting where we could control what we could control meant that we started making different decisions in the day. And I think that's really the, the part. So Juliet gave you some examples of, of why ex walking is more, moving is more, but really you're smart enough to think to yourself, how can I move more in my day? And let me tell you how that will make your life better as a CrossFitter or as an exerciser. You will be better prepared to go from zero to 60 faster. You won't need a really long warm up because you're already warmed up. You've already been moving. You've already been loading. You've already squeezed your butt. You're already kind of up and down a bunch. And if you work out and then have to go back to a work situation, if you keep moving, you'll adapt better. You'll continue to decongest. You'll, you won't get as stiff. If you want the recipe for being the stiffest person on earth, deadlift, back squat, thruster, sit. <laughs> that will get you. That will been you will there win and the done that. I can attest. <laughs> Go to the CrossFit Games. Be in med school. I guarantee you'll be like, "What happened to me? I got hit by a truck." There have been so many times, despite our knowing that this is a bad idea, that we know we're going on a long flight, and so oh, yeah. we feel exercise panicked, and so we do some crazy workout, and then get on a plane and like seize because you know we like overdid it, and then have to sit for ten continuous hours. I'm sure you've done this to yourself. Oh yeah. And then the whole first day of your trip, you're just miserable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that. Well, and I call I love it whole, bo whole body rabies is what I call it. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, all the work that you have done to advocate for standing and working and standing desks and changing positions, I think has been really powerful. And then walking too. I think walking is sexy. I think you're, I think you're doing it, Juliet. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> um, you talk, we've talked a lot about sleep already. We know how important sleep is for overall recovery and health and how shocking it is, you know, how, how little, um, people will often sleep. Um, but you also touch on nutrition. You said Juliet, or you said Kelly earlier, it, initially you didn't want to touch nutrition with the 10 foot pole, but now it's in your book. So tell us what are those, um, what was the inspiration for that? And the, the basics that you let, really let me point to Juliet just because she is actually a precision nutrition level two instructor. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, I'll start from sort of my background and my lens, right? But, but I would just want to say, it's good that you've asked this question because sometimes we've been asked like, which one of these vital signs do we struggle with? And mm. this yeah, is the one that Kelly this struggles is, with. This is my this one. Is Kelly's, this is Kelly's Achilles heel. It, mm. Achilles heel. So Achilles heel. He, here's what I'll say is that we know that if you're a sedentary, your protein intake is probably 0. 0.7 grams. If you're over 50 or you're exercising or a growing kid, you probably want it closer to one gram of mm -hmm. protein per pound body, which actually is a reasonable amount. And is actually takes a lot of attention to Holy get to that really amount, does. right? Really um, and if, if you're not paying attention to it, you are likely way below that recommendation. So it is yeah. very easy to end up underneath that recommendation. And mm -hmm. so we love hidden calorie control. We're all about it. So eat those high satiety foods, get enough protein. All of a sudden you're like, well, there's no room for cake because I'm mm -hmm. so full. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we realized is that as we were helping people with surgery and recovery and performance, we had this hole that people were not fueling. And when we usually say fueling, we're like carbohydrate for exercise, right? What I'm saying is you don't even have the building blocks for your gut, for your tissues, your connective tissue. You've just gone through this gnarly surgery and now you're basically eating, you know, apple jacks and like drinking juice on the couch. Like, what are you going to repair all of this with? You know, right. you're just going to absorb the protein from the air. So we started to see a direct correlation in terms of keeping muscle mass on people after injury, after surgery, after, you know, trauma, trying to... You, get to the bottom of that tendinopathy, all of those things, I had to really sort of realize that the best practices were making sure that people were getting enough protein and tracking that. Mm -hmm. Then we stumbled in because one of the things that happens is that we have these children and one of our daughters is a, an amazing eater. She is like a high level chef. She has a subscription cookie business. Wow! Like she is a ninja is going to go off to school and cook for the whole, all her friends. I'm, that's who she is. And we have a daughter who loves to eat brown foods. <laughs> and we'll subsist. And we literally, one of her friends, and we like shove, I'm like, you need to eat three raspberries. Otherwise I'm cutting off your finger. I mean, like we would just threaten, like, I don't like raspberries. I'm like, oh, eat this blueberry. You know, we had a, she had a friend 
who literally did not eat a micronutrient. We watched this friend go for weeks and not get any micro, whatever the micronutrients were in chicken nuggets. So we really started to realize <laughs> zero. we've got yeah. to do a better job getting micronutrients in because again, how are you going to utilize that collagen if you don't have vitamin C on board? Well, you didn't drink any vitamin C today. You haven't had any fruits and vegetables. You didn't have any fiber. So we really started dialing in. And I'll tell you, one of the reasons I rejected intermittent fasting personally was that it turned out that if I skipped that meal window, my fueling in the afternoon for my workout and He sucked. couldn't even begin to get enough protein in his eating window. And so he would be behind all the time. Totally. And then I would have to eat at like 10 o'clock to get like, just to hit some minimums. Totally. And then I was like, great. I just ate like a whole chicken and a you know jar of peanut butter at 10 o'clock. <laughs> and who sleeps great like that? So it was really wrecking my sleep. And that was why we realized that, hey, let's invite everyone to the tent. You're vegan. Cool. Show us you got enough protein because we we work with vegans. You're, you know, you're vegetarian. Cool. Show us you actually ate enough fruits and vegetables today. You didn't. You're keto. Great. We solely support that. But you can eat these fruits or eat, you know, and our friend E.C. Sinkowski, who came up with the 800 gram challenge, of course, mm -hmm. you know, really yeah. helped to under, help people understand that. An entire pound of cherries is 230 calories. Eat a bag of cherries. You'll probably have disaster pants. But that's not <laughs> my problem, but it's 230 calories. That, that Starbucks cookie, which I love, 350 calories. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one of my big, biggest nutrition inspirations is Kate Shanahan of Deep Nutrition. And I think mm -hmm. that part of that book that was so impactful for me, and, and I think she calls it the four pillars, but, you know, it's basically these four things that literally every culture since the like dawn of man have been doing the same things nutritionally, right? Like eating a broad array of vegetables, eating meat on the bone, eating fermented foods, right? There's this list of things that like, of course, culturally, it's very different. How, how cultures prepare those foods are very different, but humans have been kind of eat, been eating in the same way across all cultures. And I think that's one of the things that we, um, you know, EC's 800 gram challenge spoke to us so much is, you know, for a couple of reasons, first of all, it was the first time any quote unquote diet we ever participated in seen, you know, advocated for was actually expansive. It was like the first time that it didn't involve restriction, restriction, mm -hmm. restriction. It was expansive. It was like, eat more, eat these vegetables, like enjoy, you know, and also eat fruit. Like you're not, you know, the banana is not the problem. Like we're not obese in America because people have been eating bananas. And so I just, we all, you know, Kelly and I as individuals, our entire company, you know, when, once we discovered the 800 gram challenge, like we were sold, like you can see every one of our staff brings Tupperwares full of fruits and vegetables to the office. And it was the first time I think everybody felt like there was just this really expansive way of thinking about food. Mm -hmm. You go and, to dinner and not also, be an alien. And also so relatable because right. you know, the other, uh, you know, the other shout I want out, I want to give is uh, to this article that I'm obsessed with that it was actually an infographic series that the people at Precision Nutrition and John Berardi did, which is the cost of getting lean. Mm -hmm. And it really shows what behavior modifications you have to take to be certain body fat percentages and have shredded abs and what it looks like. And it turns out that most people, especially people in our co cohort, like thirties, forties, fifties, raising kids, working, they, they actually don't really care about, they not only don't care, they're not interested in doing the sort of extreme calorie control and restriction that would be required to have a certain body type. They're mm -hmm. willing to, you know, maybe be like plus seven pounds, if that means that they can enjoy a dinner out with their friends and have a glass of wine once a week. And that that's really what is much more realistic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we just sort of, we felt like it was expansive and fun and, you know, can, you know, allowed people to continue to eat with their friends and neighbors. And, you know, again, back to this emotional health piece, like the way we, we connect as humans is often around food. Mm -hmm. And so if we're really weird about food and really restrictive. You can't eat with your kids because you you're in some your kids, time window. <laughs> right. So we're really pulling out this like in really important part of our emotional lives and how we connect with other humans. And so, you know, we, we, and we also have found that we just felt better. If we mm -hmm. were eating 800 grams of fruits and vegetables ourselves and hitting our protein targets, we weren't eating as much crap, like Kelly said, and we just felt better. And it mm -hmm. was, it was doable and fun. I don't know if you've heard this yet, but we have an 18 year old and a 15 year old. 
And there is a concept on the internet called the almond mom. Have you heard about the almond mom? I've not heard of the almond mom. This is out of the my almond mom is a here. is a mother who is hyper obsessed with diet culture and forces those and sort of bleeds over into her kids. Got it. And when we have two daughters who are both athletes both play sports and are active, we did not want to create weirdness around food and any control issues. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, for example, we do as a family is we have the three vegetable rule. And every night when we cook dinner, we have our protein and three vegetables and then something else. And what we try to do is look at how much food we all eat and look at the way athletes fuel. Yeah. And the almond mom is that person who's like, oh, you need a snack, honey? Here's three almonds and also diet culture. And we're doing all these yeah. juice cleanses. And, you know, it's it's a culture where we saw that well-intentioned people were really sending their kids the message that, you know, food is weird, food mm -hmm. is to be controlled and losing the opportunity. You know, one of the things that, Julie, just hit on is we know as a performance advantage, all the world-class groups that we work with, they're extra world-class if they eat together. And they mm. usually eat at least one meal a week together, but the highest performers we know eat one meal a day together. They mm -hmm. sit down and break bread together. So if you're looking to create a high-performance work environment, you guys should all bring lunch together and eat at least once a week. You can do a potluck. You can just bring your own lunch. If you want a high performance family, you really should sit down to one meal together. Yeah. The research is unequivocal about that. And now we're saying, hey, look, let's expand and not make it weird. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. I think I found that, that I love EC's, what EC is doing as well. And I found that myself, you know, sometimes just focusing, if you focus on those two things, getting enough protein each day and getting your micronutrients. And I rarely hit it. It's, it's, it's it, well, number one, it's hard. Even if it's stuff that we talk about all day, like I literally talk to patients about it all day long and I have to try really hard to make it happen. Um, but I've one, one way that I've incorporated that is a green smoothie bowl. I've now oh, been doing it for the last six so months, smart. almost every single day. And it's, it's like, if you get that in, like, who cares if you eat some other stuff throughout the day? Like you've got, it's so packed with micronutrients. If you get that in and your protein intake. What, you, what is in your green smoothie bowl? Yeah. What's the recipe? Oh, it's top secret. It's top secret. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. It's a bunch of vegetables. Um, and pro I put protein powder. So it has some protein and it has some, I put toppings on it so that it has some, um, more flavor and it's palatable. Well, this is a, <laughs> this is a great example. One of the things that I do with our girls, I still make them breakfast. Oh, that's it's not awesome. that they, but it's because I can control that they're leaving the house with a protein and a micronutrient. Yeah. And one of the things we found is that if I blended up some berries and a little yogurt, I get a fermented food and berries into my kid while they're dabbing their faces for five hours in the bathroom in the morning, these girls fighting over the hairdryer and the hairbrush, <laughs> two beautiful teenage women. They're just secretly sipping on a smoothie. And, you know, that's been a big difference. Even our da oldest daughter, Georgia, who's not interested in food in the morning, she she could just be like, whatever. I, I don't really care. Caroline wakes up thinking about breakfast. Georgia doesn't care. But Georgia started asking me, could you make me a protein smoothie to take? So I would make this protein smoothie and she would leave it to me. Every sometimes I get these calls like, what's in the smoothie? Like she's like, you need to make this one again. But <laughs> I can sneak 50 or 60 grams of protein into this smoothie. Yeah. She drinks over the course of three periods of high school. I load it with collagen. It's got creatine. I know that I put a bunch of berries and fruits and like it's it is the nutrient dense thing. Mm -hmm. Again, I think eating whole foods is best, but here's a way of how we have solved what the principles are, we need to get more protein and more micronutrients into our families. The yeah. two things that I do that to try to meet these goals that have been the most effective for me. And, you know, I learned from Stacey Sims years ago that women should have protein within 30 minutes of exercise. And so I literally just shoot 20 grams of protein with water in like a shaker cup after mm -hmm. I work out. And, and that often is just the difference that allows me, to, you know, and then the rest of that that I think mm -hmm. food. And then the other thing I try to do when I leave in the morning is make sure I eat like basically a handful or two of some kind of fruit or vegetable. And, you know, I already feel like I'm well on my way, right? If I've gotten 200 grams of, you know, berries or spinach or something as, as I leave the house, I'm like, I'm going to make it right. Because I've had that protein, you know, with breakfast and a, you know, 20 grams in my smoothie and then I'm off for the day. And, you know, those are kind of my two strategies for making it, but I agree. You do have to be intentional about it. Awesome. Well, I hope that 
listeners will check out the book and go through all the assessments. I know that you also have a challenge, correct? Or another way that people can engage with these principles. So how can they check that out? We, Juliet and her team, I'm in it, but just the brilliance of Juliet. I I sometimes star in some (laughs) of the videos, but we created a 21 day video companion course for the book and it's free because we know that, you know, Hey, we can sort of engage in these behaviors of micro learning an email. You, all you have to do is go to built to move.com. You can enter your email. We won't spam the crap out of you, but you'll get access to this course. And we drop a few videos a day talking about the challenge supports the book. We should kind of walk you through some of the assessments and things. And it really is a nice way to just kind of, you know, help you begin this new habit and begin to reconceive of what your environment looks like. I love that. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to have to enroll. I have to admit, I have not done all the assessments yet, but I'm going to have to do them and report back. Um, We we know you're 10 out of 10. um, Can you please video some of them and send it, send them to us? Totally. Yeah. I know that, well, we have talked about the protein and micronutrients. I think I'm doing good on the vegetables, but um, protein, I definitely don't hit it every day. I'm going to be honest. It's it's Um, tricky. And here's what I want everyone to hear. You don't have to be perfect today. That's Tomorrow right. you get a brand new day to play the whole game over again. That's what's so great. Sometimes we, we just went down an airplane and I was like, it's like seven o'clock. I'm like, Juliet, I haven't eaten a fruit or vegetable today. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh. So I'll eat a fruit and vegetable for dinner and have some protein. And then I'll you restart that, the whole game. Like quinoa cookie on the flight. So you got that. You got the quinoa. <laughs> That's right. Do not say quinoa and cookie together. That's disgusting. Oh my goodness. And I love how you also give a sample. You have a, a part at the end giving a 24 hour cycle where you sort of lay out what a day could look yeah. like using incorporating all these principles, which is, um, it's very, very reasonable. So I think that was cool to see. Let, too. let me say that Thank you. amateurs talk tactics and professionals talk logistics. And when we mm-hmm. say logistics, we mean what are you going to do today when you wake up? What mm-hmm. happens next? Like, that's where people need. They don't, we don't need more books giving us the rationale for living forever. That's super cool. We need to know what to do with our families today. Right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So check it out. Um, and, and I, like I said, I just appreciate the focus on these basics because I will say I, you know, working with patients through wild health, we get into all kinds of weeds, like all kinds of data, nuances, genetics, but I would, I would have to say on average, my initial appointment with people, we're going through all this data, but at the end of the day, it comes down to protein, micronutrients, moving your body, sleep optimization, doing some things to support like breath work to support your nervous system. And when we start making those changes, we notice dramatic shifts and symptoms start going away. Here, we start here. feeling better. Um, and then, like you said, then we can play with the fun, like fine tuned cutting edge details and then it's cool. But, but until you have those big pieces in place, you know, you're just spitting in the ocean with the other stuff. It's not actually probably going to make much of a dirty data. Difference. Yeah. We're, That's we're, right. we're, we're trying you're to be here. actionable on you're dirty here, data. Julie. I love it. That's right. That. Well, I am sure I asked you this last time you were on the podcast, but just for fun, if you have a minute or two, we can go through the three questions. I'm still asking people the same three questions. So we can look back and see if your answers have changed. But, but the first one is what are the three things that you guys do now on a regular basis that have the biggest positive impact on your health? Um, I I would say for me, it's sleep, walk and eat protein. Um, We are lucky enough to have a sauna. And Juliet and I love the sauna mm-hmm. and it's been become a routine where we get to connect. Our kids don't like the sauna. It's too hot. So we're alone in the sauna. There's no phones in the sauna. It's pretty amazing. It's been a, it's been a great way. I love that. I was only one. I, I said yes on sleep. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, I was yeah. like, that was only one. And sleep and okay. Um, and what is one thing you're working on? So maybe of the 10, I guess you guys maybe already answered this with nutrition, mm-hmm. but what is, what, what are the things that you struggle most to get well, consistently? I can answer for Kelly that his is the nutrition. Mine is ankle dorsiflexion. I have the worst <laughs> ankle dorsiflexion of all time. And turns out I didn't really need it for the sports I did up until I found CrossFit. And, and, and um, you know, it's it's lacking. And I've had some injuries that have sort of exacerbated that problem. So that's that's my focus. My focus is, you know, trying to gain back some of what I've lost and at a minimum, keep what I've got. Love that. And then the last question is, what does a healthy life look like to you? 
Oh, Juliet and I are racing around in our stolen Corvette at like a hundred years old. Uh, you know, I think <laughs> what we imagine for ourselves, what I imagine for myself is we were finally 50 years old. We're starting to get good at our job. Our kid, we're about to have a lot more independence as our kids go away. And now is the time to be able to play. And I want to make sure that our hallway stays open, doesn't get smaller and smaller and smaller, that we can continue to ski and bike and paddle and climb and boat and do all the things we want to do for as long as we want them. That's my goal. I would say the exact same thing. Just keep keep the hallway, keep the corridor wide so we can do whatever we want to do physically and keep our mental acuity. That's Those are our two goals. Mm-hmm. I love that. And I think bringing that even back full circle to what you said at the beginning of the podcast, Juliet, about movement should be what you enjoy and what you love and should be things that you get excited about. Because so much of the time, I think we're being told these messages of like, you have to do this and this and this in order to be healthy. But if if it's feeling like you're feeling this resistance against it, or you're like, I, or you're feeling guilt if you don't do it, or all this, all these negative emotions around it, that's counterproductive. Like, those negative emotions are also probably contributing to some chronic inflammation and some other issues. So, um, so really like like, that's what, that's what it's all about. It's about joy and fun and and doing the things that you love. So I love that. Well, I think lastly, I would just say that we forgot we used to be training for something and training now has become a standalone thing and it has to have its own reason and rationale instead of I'm training so that I can go hike with my wife. I'm training so I can go be a better mountain biker. That's mm-hmm. what I think we've forgotten the narrative. Mm-hmm. I love that. Well, thank you guys for sharing. Thank you for writing this book. Um, Thanks, favorite doctor. Builttomove.com. Do up, do the challenge. Um, see how you rate. Hopefully everybody's 10 out of 10. But um, 10 out of 10. <laughs> thanks for catching up. Thanks for coming back on, guys. Thanks so much, Julie. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you enjoy listening to the podcast, please consider subscribing and giving it a five-star rating on iTunes. It really does help to get the word out to more people.